This audio presentation was pre-recorded and edited for brevity and clarity. Hello and welcome to today's Bright Focus Glaucoma Chat. My name is Casey Baez, VP of Integrated Marketing and Communications at Bright Focus, and I'm so happy you're here today to chat with us about cataracts and glaucoma, what you should know in 2024. Our Glaucoma Chats are a monthly program in partnership with the American Glaucoma Society designed to provide people with with glaucoma and the family and friends who support them with information straight from experts. Bright Focus is committed to investing in bold research worldwide that generates novel approaches, diagnostic tools, and life-enhancing treatments that serve all populations in the fight against age-related brain and vision diseases. Today, we're excited to introduce guest expert, Dr. Aki Shukla. Dr. Shukla is the Leonard A. Lauder Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology at Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Shukla has published over 70 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and has been invited to speak nationally and internationally on patient care and research. She serves on many advisory boards and her research interests include structure function relationships in glaucoma, optimization of surgical outcomes, and sustainability in ophthalmology. She is passionate about trainee education in the clinic and operating room and is committed to excellent clinical care. Welcome, Dr. Shukla. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us on this Valentine's Day as we show our eyes some love. Um, So today we'll just dive right in and talk about glaucoma and cataracts. And just starting off with a foundation of uh, what is a cataract? Great question. So what is a cataract? A cataract is clouding of the natural lens of the eye. This lens lies between the iris, uh, right behind the pupil, the very center of the eye. Uh, The lens adjusts its shape and thickness to focus the light rays that enter through the cornea and through the pupil onto the retina. And the clouding of the lens can lead to vision problems by preventing light from passing clearly through the lens, causing blurred or distorted vision. A cataract is a common condition that's associated with aging, but can also occur due to other reasons like injury, the use of certain medications, or certain medical conditions. Um, I guess we should also talk about what glaucoma is. Maybe we can quickly define that, too. So glaucoma is a number of different eye diseases that are characterized by specific patterns of optic nerve damage that's visible when one views the optic nerve just by looking at the optic nerve and also when one uh, tests uh, the function of the optic nerve. So uh, visual fields are another way to kind of test for glaucoma. In glaucoma, lowering the eye pressure usually slows the progression of disease, so it prevents someone from getting worse glaucoma. And although the lowering of the eye pressure is important in preventing the worsening of glaucoma, the eye pressure can really be high or uh, can be high or normal or even low, uh, and one can still have glaucoma. Thanks for explaining what glaucoma is. It's important to understand that it's not just one disease, but a series of diseases. And um, cataracts versus glaucoma, I think there's differences in being able to reverse, um, you know, glaucoma versus cataracts. And so do do cataracts cause um, glaucoma? And what are the symptoms of cataracts in comparison to glaucoma? Good question. So cataracts themselves usually do not cause glaucoma. However, you know, both conditions can coexist in the same individual. Uh, Sometimes people with very advanced cataracts have an increased risk of having uh, elevated eye pressure, and this can lead to the increasing risk of developing glaucoma. Um, A large lens or a more spherically shaped lens can sometimes also crowd the anterior chamber angle, which is where the natural drain of the eye is located. And so removing the lens in these cases can help lessen um, the risk for particular types of glaucoma in which the angle of the eye becomes very narrow or closed. Um, They are, however, distinct conditions. Cataracts, I like to say that, you know, if we all live long enough, um, then we'll all get cataracts. Uh, Glaucoma, however, you know, does not affect the entire population the way that the cataracts do uh, with time. The symptoms of cataracts, 
uh, versus the symptoms of glaucoma. So uh, there is some overlap in symptoms, um, but they are they are fairly different. So symptoms of cataracts include blurry or cloudy vision, difficulty seeing at nighttime, kind of a fading of colors. People tell me they can no longer match socks as well, um, or the movies just don't seem as bright to them. Um, people also complain of glare, sensitivity to light, seeing halos around lights, especially when driving or looking at street lights. Um, glaucoma, on the other hand, often early on has no symptoms. Uh, people do over time describe experiencing some glare. Um, they can also see um, that maybe they have some peripheral or maybe even central vision loss or areas of blurring, areas where um, the images don't seem as crisp. In the later stages of glaucoma, uh, and I guess the final stages of glaucoma, the eye can completely lose vision. And what's very important that distinguishes the two conditions also is that glaucoma leads to irreversible vision loss. So anything one loses from the glaucoma, we cannot bring that back. It's all about preventing the vision loss due to optic nerve damage and glaucoma. Cataracts, however, are completely reversible. So when one decides to get cataract surgery, any vision that's lost from the cataract really should come back after that surgery. So in general, you know, when patients have cataracts, I, for the most part, I leave it up to them when they want to get the cataract surgery. However, with glaucoma, sometimes it really requires, um, you know, educating the patient and talking to them about the condition and really kind of explaining that we're trying to prevent vision loss in this case. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of creating that sort of understanding with the patient um, and sometimes having them undergo surgery even when they don't necessarily have symptoms um, just to try to prevent those symptoms from developing over time as if glaucoma, you know, if we think that glaucoma will progress uh, without that sort of treatment. But does glaucoma actually cause cataracts? That's a good question. So glaucoma does not directly cause cataracts. Um, they are separate eye conditions, but a person can have glaucoma and cataracts simultaneously. They have some of the same risk factors, the main one being age. Um, and another example is if one has a history of eye trauma or if one chronically uses steroid medications, um, both of these situations can increase the risk of cataract development earlier in life and can also increase the risk of glaucoma. That's so fascinating. And can a person be more at risk for a glaucoma versus their risk for cataracts? Understanding that um, there are different diseases and age is a factor for both, but um, can a person just naturally be more at risk for one versus the other? That's a good question. So um, I guess maybe first I'll speak about cataracts. So um, like we were saying, you know, everyone, if we are lucky to live long enough, we're all going to develop cataract over time. Um, there are some families in which cataracts show up earlier. So sometimes babies are born with cataracts um, and they need cataract surgery very early on in their life to allow them to develop vision in their eyes. And then, um, you know, there are some people who get cataracts in their 30s and 40s requiring cataract surgery. But I would say the majority of people who are getting cataract surgery are at least in their late 50s and beyond. Um, and so aging is really the primary risk factor for cataracts. Other risk factors also include diabetes, smoking, uh, prolonged exposure to sunlight, uh, certain medications. Um, glaucoma, however, uh, you know, affects anywhere from 2 to 6% of the population, so much lower percentage than, uh, than cataract. And the risk factors for glaucoma include age, especially those over the age of 50, a family history of glaucoma. So if one has a first-degree relative with glaucoma, they have a nine times greater risk of the disease, and most people are unaware that they have this greater risk with that family history. Um, certain types of ancestry, so African-American ancestry or Asian ancestry, uh, can often predispose one to glaucoma. That's just, it's a more common condition in those groups. Um, those of Hispanic ethnicity are also at higher risk of developing glaucoma, and people who have diabetes are at higher risk of developing glaucoma. In general, we recommend that everyone, you know, 40 years or older should have a comprehensive eye exam performed every one to two years. 
to uh, pick up these conditions because especially as we were talking about glaucoma is totally asymptomatic in the beginning so it really requires um, you know the, the physician picking this up uh, on eye exam uh, patients really can't tell in the beginning that that this is something that's affecting their eyes okay thank you and i think many people don't realize that cataracts and glaucoma can both occur even as early as as birth and so um, understanding your history and your risk is so important as you mentioned and you touched on the eye exam and so what exactly happens during an eye exam for cataracts and how is this different from an eye exam for glaucoma Sure, good question. So uh, a complete eye exam is required for both cataract and glaucoma diagnosis, and also importantly to rule out other conditions that can lead to vision loss. So this generally involves um, going in person to see the doctor. Um, you'll be, um, they'll check your visual acuity. So that means kind of reading off the eye chart that we're all pretty familiar with. They'll check your intraocular pressure. So that's the pressure inside your eye, which is you know, different from blood pressure. They'll check your visual fields um, and assess uh, the reactivity of your pupil um, to see how well uh, the eye reacts um, and the iris constricts to light. A uh, microscope called a slit lamp will be used to assess the front of the eye, which includes the cornea, the iris, the lens or the cataract, as well as the back of the eye, which includes the retina and optic nerve. And uh, especially when we're assessing glaucoma, but really for everyone, uh, everyone deserves one uh, gonioscopy exam. And in this exam, a special mirror is used to assess the angle of the eye. That's where the natural drain of the eye is located. And if the angle of the eye is deemed to be open, your ophthalmologist will likely dilate the eye to better assess the cataract and uh, you know, evaluate the posterior segment. That's where the retina and the optic nerve are. And if there's any suspicion of glaucoma or retinal disease, your doctor will perform a special scan of your optic nerve and retina called optical coherence tomography. And this test takes a picture of your optic nerve and retina and really uses light waves to mic uh, visualize microscopic abnormalities that may be present. And this test can help us determine if the earliest signs of glaucoma are present. You'll also have the thickness of your cornea measured because this can be um, a risk factor for glaucoma as well. Um, if there is a suspicion of glaucoma, they'll also check your peripheral or side vision as this is most commonly affected first. Um, of course, some patients can have central loss prior to their peripheral visual field involvement, but all of this really needs to be tested using um, automated perimetry, which is kind of a standardized way of checking one's visual field. If your doctor is planning on doing cataract surgery or if they see a visually significant cataract and you know, they're kind of discussing it with you, they will obtain a biometry test uh, that helps measure the front and back of the eye. Um, and it also takes some measurements of the, um, the lens itself. They may also obtain a map of the cornea to see how the cornea is shaped. They'll measure your refraction or what type of glasses you're currently using. And they'll also importantly have a conversation with you about your preferences, um, about what you know sort of activities you like to do. Um, are you and are you someone who wishes to see a distance without glasses, um, or and wear reading glasses for up close, or are you someone who prefers to be able to read without glasses and you really don't mind glasses for driving? Once your doctor has all of this information, they'll help you choose an intraocular lens or an artificial lens that best fits your eye's anatomy and your own preferences, and then that'll be the lens that they'll put in during the cataract surgery. Okay, so you mentioned cataract surgery. So what are all of the treatment options for cataracts, and, and can cataracts and glaucoma be treated at the same time? Great question. So, um, you know, the early symptoms of cataracts, um, like a little bit of blur or changing refraction, um, can be helped with just getting a new pair of glasses. But eventually, one reaches the point where glasses are not really helping, and the glare and the dimness and maybe the lack of color contrast is something that's bothersome enough. And then um, you go down the surgery route. So the only real way to fix cataracts is um, performing cataract surgery. That's the only way to treat the cataract. And the surgery involves removing the cloudy lens and replacing it with a clear intraocular lens, which is an artificial lens. And so um, 
Um, let's talk a little bit briefly about the surgery. So this is a same day outpatient surgery. Um, so you get there about an hour before surgery. Surgery itself um, you know, can take anywhere from you know, 10 to 50 minutes uh, based on the complexity of your cataract. It may take even longer if uh, other procedures are required. Um, and then the patient goes home typically about an hour after surgery. Uh, several decades ago, patients used to stay in the hospital for cataract surgery for several days, but this is definitely not the case anymore. Um, and so, um, uh, I guess uh, let's talk a little bit about the surgical day. So you arrive at the surgical facility about an hour or two before surgery. When you get there, they'll have you change into a gown. You'll get an IV put in your arm. You'll review some paperwork, and then we'll dilate your eye. Then you'll go into the operating room. Um, during the surgery, you receive twilight anesthesia. It's a similar type of anesthesia as one would get for a colonoscopy. So you can um, hear some sounds, see some lights, but you really shouldn't feel any pain, and you shouldn't feel anxious about the situation. Um, during the surgery, like we mentioned, you, we remove the lens, the, the cataract, and put in a new clear intraocular lens. And then uh, once the surgery is all wrapped up, then you go into the post-operative recovery area where you, you know, wake up from anesthesia pretty much instantly and then um, are on your way home, uh, you know, about 10, 30 minutes or so later. Uh, you asked whether we can treat cataract and glaucoma at the same time. This is becoming increasingly more common. Um, so, you know, there are different types of surgeries for glaucoma. There's a whole category of surgery called minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. These have become more popular in the last uh, 10 to 12 years or so. And uh, these typically involve either the placement of a tiny stent in the eye, and that stent goes into the natural drain of the eye, or it involves a procedure called goniotomy in which we create an opening in the natural drain of the eye, and that opening helps us bypass resistance in the natural drain of the eye that we think is present in people with glaucoma. Um, there are a number of other uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries in the pipeline. I would say those are probably the two most common ones. Um, there are also bigger surgeries for glaucoma, including trabeculectomy and a tube shunt. Um, and both of these surgeries actually involve creating a brand new drain for the eye. Trabeculectomy, uh, in trabeculectomy, we create a drain using your eye's natural tissues. And in a tube shunt, we actually place an implant onto the eye that acts like the new drain for the eye. And these surgeries can be done at the same time as cataract surgery. Um, one of the advantages of doing that is that, you know, it's really one surgical procedure for the, for the patient. So it's, you know, one instance of anesthesia and tends to be more convenient in that way. It's um, not, and it's also just one um, recovery process. So it's all done kind of at the same time. Um, you know, your doctor will be kind of the best person to assess uh, first of all, whether you need cataract surgery, then if you need, if you do have glaucoma, whether you need minimally invasive glaucoma surgery along with the cataract surgery or uh, one of the conventional surgeries, including trabeculectomy and tube shunt. But there are plenty of options. Um, and, you know, it's a nice opportunity to try to limit some, some of the eye drops that you may be on. Um, I, I, uh, I would say that sometimes the recovery takes a little bit longer if one is to get a glaucoma procedure along with cataract surgery. So that's something we can talk about a little bit more, um, but that is just one small consideration. But many times it really is worth it to do these additional procedures to get the glaucoma under control the same time as doing the cataract surgery. And so how safe would cataract surgery be for glaucoma patients? Are there risks or adverse effects um, on patients with glaucoma when it comes to cataract surgery? Great question. So cataract surgery is generally safe for all glaucoma patients. Um, you know, the main risk of cataract surgery includes infection inside the eye, bleeding inside the eye, changes to the eye pressure, needing to go back to the operating room to do a second procedure, um, or, you know, needing to go back if um, the entire lens was not able to be removed from the eye. The risk of all of these procedures, uh, the risk of all of these outcomes happening is really very, very low. It's less than 1%. Um, you know, if your eye has a particular type of anatomy, let's say you are uh, someone who's extremely nearsighted, uh, you know, you also 
there is some risk of retinal detachment in everyone who's getting cataract surgery. But if your anatomy is very different from average, such as, you know, if you're very nearsighted, then your risk of retinal detachment may be a little bit higher. So everyone's uh, individual risk is different, but the overall risk is extremely low, and uh, the risk for glaucoma patients doesn't really differ from the risk of the uh, cataract surgery for the average person um, in a big way. Um, you'll want to be sure that your surgeon knows how to manage glaucoma during the postoperative period because there can be some temporary increases in pressure associated with some of the postoperative eye drops or even some of the solutions that we use during the surgery. And so for these reasons, um, you know, your doctor may need to watch you more closely than other patients who undergo cataract surgery and do not have glaucoma. And as mentioned, your recovery, if you have glaucoma, uh, especially if you undergo a glaucoma procedure along with cataract surgery, may take longer than if you're getting cataract surgery alone. But then, of course, you're getting the benefits of the glaucoma procedure as well, and um, you know, your sight will be maintained uh, perhaps in a superior way than if you were to just get cataract surgery alone. Okay, thank you. And so, will cataract surgery lower eye pressure, and, and should one have cataract surgery instead of glaucoma surgery? That's a good question. So cataract surgery has been demonstrated to have a modest effect on eye pressure. And in some cases, in many cases, it has been shown to lower eye pressure um, anywhere from two millimeters of mercury to 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, you know, some people having less or more of an effect there. Um, this is especially the case in eyes with angle closure glaucoma. In these eyes, the front of the eye um, is, is smaller and kind of more crowded than the average eye. So removing the cataract and putting in um, the cataract is removing the cataract, which tends to be pretty bulky, and putting in an intraocular lens. Um, the artificial lens, which actually is very thin, uh, can open up a lot of space in the interior chamber, and then that can help lower the pressure. Um, and so in some folks who have angle closure glaucoma, uh, Doing the cataract surgery, even doing it alone um, as a first step, may be what your physician chooses to do instead of doing cataract surgery plus glaucoma surgery as a first step. Um, it's really so individual for uh, every patient, um, but I would say, you know, if you're going to do cataract surgery instead of glaucoma surgery, um, if for angle closure eyes, that's something I would certainly consider. Um, but if somebody has very advanced glaucoma and you know has high pressures and clearly is showing signs of damage and maybe even progression, then probably you need more than just cataract surgery alone. You probably need a combined cataract and glaucoma procedure. Thank you. Always important to get a personalized uh, plan and guidance with your doctor. But it's so great to have. So many options. And so when it comes to implants, so what are the different types of lens implants and which lens should someone with glaucoma get? Great question. So there are a variety of different types of intraocular lenses, including monofocal lenses, multifocal lenses, and toric lenses, and they're each designed to sp address specific visual needs. In general, we do not recommend multifocal lenses for patients with glaucoma because they can, um, so the advantage of multifocal lenses is that they can theoretically help you see at distance and up close without the use of glasses. So it's kind of like the vision that we all have when we're young, where we're not re reaching for reading glasses or anything like that. We have good vision at distance and up close. However, um, these lenses, it can lower your overall contrast sensitivity, making your overall vision more dim. And in patients with glaucoma and other eye conditions um, that are already reducing their vision, multifocal lenses are not recommended in that case. Um, toric lenses are an option for certain people who have certain types of astigmatism that affect the cornea, um, that change the curvature of the cornea. And these are a fine option. So, you know, if there's a patient with glaucoma who has significant corneal astigmatism and it's deemed to be reg regular corneal astigmatism and I can't find other corneal problems, 
uh, toric lenses are a fine option um, for folks with glaucoma and astigmatism who do not need conventional glaucoma surgery at the same time as cataract surgery or any time in the near future. And the reason is that conventional glaucoma surgery can actually change the corneal curvature and would change the type of toric lens that someone would need. So, um, so we don't recommend the toric lens procedure if other surgeries are planned. Um, and then monofocal lenses are the most common type of lenses that are put in the eye, and they're a safe choice for everyone. Okay, great. And so the lenses, are they different for closed angle versus open angle glaucoma? Good question. So lens choices shouldn't differ too much for uh, people with closed angle or open angle glaucoma. You know, your surgeon may identify other risks, such as not having support in the capsular bag, which is where the artificial lens will sit after cataract surgery. And so they may end up choosing a particular type of lens, such as a three-piece lens, to more securely have the eye, to have the lens in the eye in these cases. Um, and if they don't find enough support in the capsular bag, they may avoid something like a toric lens, which can rotate and move, and you know if that happens, then your vision um, you end up needing an even bigger glasses prescription than you may have had before. So um, in general, there really shouldn't be any difference in lens choices between closed angle versus open angle glaucoma. But there are so many other considerations about the eye's anatomy that the surgeon takes into account when choosing the type of lens. Okay, thank you. That's so helpful and. Our listeners do have a lot of uh, questions around this topic, and one of the questions we received is, should people with glaucoma receive steroids during cataract surgery or use steroids after the surgery? And how often are glaucoma patients steroid responders versus people without glaucoma? This is a great question. So, you know, after cataract surgery, the eye generally responds very favorably to cataract surgery. You know, the average person does very well, but everybody needs some sort of anti-inflammatory eye drop after cataract surgery. And I would say for most surgeons, the drops of choice are a steroid eye drop. So almost everyone's gonna be on some sort of steroid after cataract surgery. Um, generally, we start with something like prednisolone four times a day. Some people might need it uh, more frequently, and then we taper it off after a cataract surgery over the course of about a month or so. Um, over time now, these kind of depot steroids have become more common, and uh, the advantage of these depot steroids is that patients don't have to use drops as often after surgery or may not need to use drops at all. These are a fine option, but uh, in the setting of glaucoma, I would hesitate to use these on my patients because of this risk of steroid response. The nice thing about drops is if I start to see that, okay, I'm having my patients using the steroid drops, the pressure is starting to go up, then I know that I can always decrease the, steroid, the frequency of the steroid drop and uh, manage their pressure that way. A steroid depot is something that's going to be sitting in the eye, that's going to be acting, and I have no way to titrate the effect of the steroid after surgery. So um, personally, I would recommend definitely uh, using steroid drops and probably avoiding the steroid depot. So how do the steroids work? Um, so the steroids can alter the microstructure of the trabecular meshwork, which is the natural drain of the eye. Uh, they can influence the turnover of the substances um, that live there, which can increase the resistance to outflow and can increase the eye pressure. Um, you know, how many, what percentage of the population has steroid response? It's, it's hard to know exactly how many, but uh, it's been estimated that about 30% of people show a moderate increase in pressure uh, after using these steroid eye drops, and about 5% of people are highly responsive to these steroid eye drops in which they have, you know, high IOP elevation, like more than 10 millimeters of mercury once they start using steroid eye drops. So, um, there is, a, there, there is a proportion of the population that's going to be very sensitive. Um, I watch my patients very carefully when I start them on these types of medications, just knowing that it's possible. And it is more common amongst people who have glaucoma um, to have this response to the steroids um, than as compared to people who don't have glaucoma. So I'm certainly more aware in my patient population and I look out for this. And that's really the reason why I would avoid the longer acting depot steroid. Okay, thank you. That is so helpful. Um, we have an additional listener question, and it's 
can cataracts cause a blind spot to be a blind spot area to be reported on visual field tests? Good question. So cataracts can definitely affect one's vision. Um, you know, that's why we choose to do cataract surgery to improve people's vision and quality of life. Um, they can also show up in the visual field in certain ways. So generally in glaucoma, we're looking for focal defects in the visual field. Cataracts can lead to an overall more generalized depression um, of the visual field. So um, it's interesting, like I, I, you know, I of course get baseline visual fields on, on everyone, but sometimes it's fun to kind of check the visual field uh, a month or two after the person's had cataract surgery. And many times there is some improvement improvement in the visual field after the cataract surgery because that kind of generalized depression has lifted uh, once the cataract has been removed. So there can be some areas that are kind of, um, sort of faded or have more of a defect because of cataracts in the visual field. Okay, great. Thank you. And just thinking about the cataract surgery again, you mentioned taking drops for a certain number of, of weeks. And so, but how long does it take generally to recover from cataract surgery, particularly if you if you have glaucoma? Sure. So I t usually tell people that it can it will take about a month, um, you know, uh, for to be fully recovered. And you know, certain proportion of people it's going to take longer than a month. And I would say probably the majority of people it takes less than a month, but I ask people to expect at least a month uh, for recovery. Um, generally, I tell people, you know, the day after surgery, you may feel that the vision is a lot better. You may feel that it's worse. You may feel it's the same. It's hard to predict that. Um, but a week out after surgery, you'll probably feel that the vision has improved. And then a month out, you will feel a pretty significant improvement. But like I said, there is a proportion of people who will take even longer to um, to improve and to stabilize. And do you have any tips on how to have a successful recovery from cataract surgery if you have glaucoma? Good question. So, you know, number one, of course, following your doctor's guidance and instructions um, to the T would be helpful. There are going to be a lot of things that change. So, you know, prior, if you're someone who has cataracts and glaucoma, you're most likely going to be on some sort of eye drop for glaucoma before surgery. Um, it's very important to know um, after the surgery exactly how the drops are changing because uh, more than likely your surgeon is going to start you on a steroid drop and an antibiotic drop and then you need to ask them well so what what should I do now with my glaucoma drops should I continue them should I take them off and a lot of that's going to be dependent on whether you had just a cataract surgery alone or whether you had cataract plus a glaucoma surgery so your surgeon will be able to tell you that Generally, you'll be asked to use a clear plastic shield to cover the eye when you're sleeping, and that's really to prevent the eye from hitting your pillow or from accidentally rubbing the eye. Um, usually for about a week or so, you're told to restrict your activities, not lift anything heavier than 10 pounds, um, not bend over, or doing activities that would really strain your body. I tell people it's absolutely fine to use your eyes for anything you'd like. You can read, watch TV, et cetera. Um, those are kind of my standard instructions. I also tell people no eye makeup, um, you know, don't get soap in your eye for a few days. Um, and, you know, I, I think I also tell people importantly, every day things should be the same or they should get a little bit better. If anything is getting worse, that's really not normal and our office needs to be alerted right away. The risk of infection after cataract surgery is rare, but if it happens, it's very serious and needs to be treated right away. So um, really kind of following your doctor's instructions, I think, are the best way to kind of go about doing things. Um, something additional that you could consider is using some more artificial tear drops to uh, lubricate the eye, to kind of optimize the ocular surface to help uh, speed in recovery. If you are using artificial tear drops, I'd recommend waiting about 30 minutes between the medicated drops and artificial tear drops um, because you don't want the artificial tear drops to dilute the medicated drops. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. And our listeners have another question, and it's what pressure range indicates that mid-surgery should accompany cataract removal? 
interesting question. So, you know, it's really so different for everyone. Um, and this question, uh, the answer to this question depends on number one, how much glaucoma damage the person has. So, um, you know, if you have very advanced glaucoma and your pressures are um, 20, that really might be too high uh, given you have advanced glaucoma. And so then you probably do need uh, combined glaucoma and cataract surgery. If you have no evidence of glaucoma at all um, and you just have pressures that are in the, you know, uh, above whatever target pressure that your doctor has set for you, um, it's possible that the MIGS option is kind of an optional thing. Um, but a lot of it depends on your level of glaucoma damage, um, you know, how many eye drops you're using, how well you're able to tolerate those eye drops, and, um, you know, kind of what your rate of progression is, and not only how much damage do you have, but how much, how quickly is it getting worse. A um, number of different considerations. There was, there's really no cutoff um, in the range of pressures that tells me this person definitely needs MIGs or not. But for most people who are on a drop, they are looking for opportunities to get off that drop. And the MIGS procedure or other glaucoma procedures do give you those opportunities. So I usually offer it to most patients um, if possible, if they're, if they're already on a glaucoma eye drop or if they have significant findings of glaucoma when I examine their optic nerve or have them do a visual field. Okay, great. Thank you. And our last question from our listener is, if you have retinal vein occlusion, can you still have surgery for glaucoma and cataracts? Good question. So um, retinal vein occlusion and uh, glaucoma have been found to be somewhat comorbid in that they, they are kind of associated to occur together. They don't always occur together, of course, but um, there is some association between those two conditions. And certainly, if you have a history of retinal vein occlusion and you have uncontrolled eye pressures, then certainly you can have glaucoma surgery. Um, and cataract surgery, like we talked about, you know, everyone in their lifetime, if they live long enough, um, will need cataract surgery. So that's fine to do in the setting of retinal vein occlusion as well. Uh, whenever I do these surgeries in the setting of any retinal disease, and you know, specifically retinal vein occlusion, I work very closely with a retina specialist because it's possible that you may need an um, eye injection uh, of, uh, you need an injection in your eye of anti-VEGF, which is a vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, medicine that can help reduce swelling uh, before the surgery or help prevent swelling from developing in the eye after the surgery. So um, generally, you know, if you have a history of retinal vein occlusion, I would make sure that your retina specialist knows that I'm planning on doing cataract surgery and your retina specialist may choose to do one of these injections or, you know, pre-treat you, pre you with a certain kind of um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory eye drop prior to the cataract surgery to prevent the chance of uh, swelling or other problems occurring, uh, other problems related to the retinal vein occlusion uh, occurring after cataract surgery. Thank you, Dr. Shukla. That's so valuable for our listeners to know these topics are so complex and surgery can generate a lot of complex feelings and questions, and so it's always helpful to be prepared with expert information. And so is there anything you'd like to share with our listeners regarding glaucoma and cataracts, any parting tips on the subject that maybe we haven't touched on? I think your questions have really been excellent and comprehensive. Um, the biggest thing I would say is I think it's important uh, for the listeners to know that um, is that they really should form a connection with their glaucoma specialist. You know, this is someone that they're going to know for a very long time. Uh, as glaucoma is a chronic disease, and it's sort of a silent disease that your uh, the glaucoma specialist has to help uh, translate for the patients. Um, you know, by uh, evaluating all the scans and testing that we do, the, the, it's important for the glaucoma specialist to really help the patient understand what all of these things mean and what the significance of the condition is. So uh, make sure that you take time to really get to know your glaucoma specialist and that you feel comfortable with the person that you're seeing because that person is going to be an important person who kind of helps navigate um, the field of ophthalmology and helps navigate a condition that can be pretty anxiety-provoking otherwise. So um, 
that would be my main advice to the listeners out there. Uh, make sure you find a glaucoma specialist you love. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Shukla, for all of the important information that you shared with us today. Um, that wraps up our questions, and thank you to our listeners so much for joining us today for our Glaucoma Chat. Next month on Wednesday, March 13th, we will dive into building connection and community, taking charge of your glaucoma diagnosis, and we hope that you can join us then. And until then, thank you again for joining us, and that concludes today's Bright Focus Glaucoma Chat. The information provided in this recording is a public service of Bright Focus Foundation and is not intended to constitute medical advice. Please consult your physician for personalized medical, dietary, and or exercise advice. Any medications or supplements should only be taken under medical supervision. Bright Focus Foundation does not endorse any medical products or therapies.